ะเรามีครูผู้จะ speakers and champions of inclusivity to share their experiences in finding innovative smart solutions to improve public participation access to services safety and livability in cities My name is Robin Bush. I'm the country representative for the Asia Foundation in Malaysia, and I will be your host for today. Before going any further, we wanted to go over just a few housekeeping notes. We're happy to say that simultaneous interpretation is available in five languages today: Bahasa Indonesia, Khmer, Lao, Thai, and Vietnamese. To access the language of your preference, please go to the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom page, and that should take you to the drop-down. A list of available languages. You can see it on the screen. As per the norm, uh, when speakers are presenting, we ask everyone to keep yourself on mute, please. However, during the Q&A sessions, we encourage you to use your hand raise function so that we can invite you to join in and share your thoughts. And our team will also be moderating the chat function. So please uh, take every uh, vehicle and, and opportunity to share your reflections and ask questions throughout the course of the event. We are sharing this session. For sharing at a later stage, do let us know if you do not want to be recorded. We would love to make this session and this this event uh, as interactive as possible. We encourage you to keep your videos on if you're comfortable doing so. So, as I think most of you probably know, uh, this event builds on the recent recently concluded Inclusive Cities Dialogues. This was a series of discussions with 185 stakeholders across several ASEAN cities that looked at the difficulties faced by women and girls, persons with disabilities, the urban poor, and it shared efforts that were being taken by both government and civil society across ASEAN to make cities more inclusive. We thought this morning, rather than talk through the key insights from these dialogues, that we would show a short video that's going to share some of the key highlights and our reflections from these enriching conversations. So, over to the committee for the video. Hello, we are excited to welcome you to the Inclusive Cities event. We started our journey with an understanding that folks working on inclusion were not adequately leveraging technology and that people working on smart solutions to urban challenges were not always ensuring that solutions were strengthening inclusion. We also knew that there is huge potential in Southeast Asia for smart solutions to tackle inclusion challenges a gap that the trust fund has been working to fill. We posed the question, what are the challenges of inclusion in urban spaces from the perspectives of those experiencing them? What are the smart solutions that are emerging to tackle these? And we knew that the only way we could answer these questions was to talk to people, to policymakers, and government officials from the national to the local level, to development practitioners, civil society activists, and researchers, to the private sector. Over the course of six months, we held nine inclusive cities dialogues with over 185 stakeholders from seven countries and 14 cities. A total of 25 speakers shared their insights into challenges and initiatives. During these dialogues, four key messages emerged. First, we have seen that there is incredible energy for more inclusive change. Despite resource and capacity challenges, there are reform champions across government departments. Like Ba Muhammad Ramdhan Pamanto, mayor of Makassar, Indonesia, who wants to do more to address inequities in their cities. Many such champions also attended our dialogues to share the work they're leading. In the next midterm development plan of 2021 to 2026, so in this midterm development plan, we have put all of this about uh, human rights friendly and disability friendly and also the elderly people friendly, gender friendly. We have put all of those there. So we are sure that in the future, Samarang City will be better. Many civil society organizations are also implementing creative initiatives to provide employment opportunities, 
address public safety issues and contribute to urban infrastructure planning. In several cities government and non-government actors are working together productively, whether on policies, budget allocations, or pilot programs. We heard examples of universities providing data for local planning in Samarang, civil society working with the government in Phnom Penh on better data collection, and greater cross-sectoral collaboration to reduce gender-based violence in Penang. This reform momentum is an opportunity. Here is an example from Penang City, Malaysia. What the app shows you is that when uh, you open your location, if you're a domestic violence victim, what it does is that it shows you uh, the houses with love is basically uh, places you can seek help. So they are either the Adun Service Centre or NGOs that are considered as the first support point. Uh, if you can see the police, uh, is the, it's the police station and H is for the hospitals. And then, of course, you can actually search over here. So if you click there, then it will tell you that, you know, an NGO is very near you, it's like 0.4 kilometers away. So how do you go about it? Our second insight is that prejudicial norms and values are the number one barrier to realizing more inclusive urban spaces. Tangible barriers are significant, whether transport, financial, or otherwise. But dialogue participants were of one voice on this point. Addressing these barriers requires efforts to transform negative attitudes, norms, and values towards disadvantaged communities that are often the root cause for these barriers to exist in the first place. For instance, Indonesian transgender activist Merlin Sopjan walked us through a multi-pronged approach to working with individuals, families, and local communities to strengthen the acceptance of transgender individuals and securing their legal identity. The third key insight is the significant gaps between words and deeds. In some cities, there are already policy frameworks that encourage mainstreaming of inclusion as well as dedicated efforts to support and empower specific groups. However, many participants acknowledged that there remains more to be done to make these goals a reality. Let's hear from Radha Chor from Humanity and Inclusion, Cambodia on policy evaporation and the implementation gap problem here lies the policy implementation gap is uh, one point that uh, makes those problems still persist. Accessibility issue and knowledge on that, uh, the cost and resources uh, in the city that uh, we need to have a uh, human resource and also the, the budget to uh, renovate or improve the infrastructure in the cities. We agree that resources for implementation is limited and much on-the-ground programming still depends on NGO projects. While these are of great value individually, the bigger picture is one of fragmentation, lack of coordination, and missed opportunities to share knowledge and replicate good practices. As Hazana Akir from Malaysia articulated so well. If you have a problem, of course the national and city government will not be able to know unless there is like community members or city residents that raise up the issue uh, and especially in certain cases of course we do think that working uh, together hand in hand with private sectors employees and even contractors can actually help this kind of thing so um, i think when you talk about these kind of questions uh, it's not really per se who should play a role but how do each of them play a role in addressing the urban safety challenges Finally, the fourth key insight is that there are few comprehensive or intersectional approaches to inclusion. Most efforts to improve access and opportunities in urban areas tend to focus on specific identity groups, leaving little opportunity for a collective voice on inclusion more broadly, or awareness of compounded disadvantage among planners, policymakers, and respective interest groups. Siloed thinking around social exclusion makes it harder to address. While poverty is a barrier to some, disability a barrier for others, and gender discrimination a barrier for yet others, inclusive approaches will be strengthened and responses made more effective when overlapping disadvantages are addressed. And here's Sheila, one of our participants from the Philippines, who expresses this so beautifully. Lack of the, the intersectionality perspective among, um, uh, across all uh, levels of uh, development process can uh, is also a key barrier uh, as uh, uh, intersectionality is like uh, most of the time 
think as an afterthought. It's not people are seen in one day in in just like one dimensional thing. Like for example, you're a person with disability, just that you do not see the gender dimension, the age dimension. So um, the the solutions are only seen in just uh, one in only one dimension. So I think that's also a challenge. So let's dive into why we are here today and get started. This event has three main objectives. One, learn about successful policy and program initiatives from the region. Two, initiate and strengthen regional networks among reform champions across municipalities and local government in trust fund cities. And three, connect with policymakers and innovators across the urban governance ecosystem. Let's look forward to learning and building from the valuable work already taking place across ASEAN cities. All right, that was a great uh, recap of those dialogues and uh, outline of the way forward for this event. Now, before moving into our opening remarks, we do want to do something that's usually done towards the end. This time we're gonna do it at the beginning, which is take a picture. Um, everyone likes to have these photos for their records and their social media. So I'd like to invite everyone to please switch on your camera so that we can take a picture together. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I'm going to start taking screenshots, but since there are multiple, uh, lots of us here, uh, I just request you to hold on as we start. Uh, we we'll just have to do this five times. Okay, one. <coughs> Thank you. There are lots of familiar faces here and we're hoping that by doing this right in the beginning, we encourage you to keep your videos on for the rest of the session. Back to you, Robin. All right, thank you, Sumaya. And now we are ready to actually formally open this event and we're uh, delighted to have two individuals here to provide opening remarks. Uh, first, I'd like to invite the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, Deputy Head of Mission to the Australian Mission to the ASEAN, Caroline Scott, to present your opening remarks. Thanks, Robin, and good morning, everyone, and appreciate this opportunity to meet with you for this um, important and already really interesting event. Um, the Australian government is committed to promoting and enabling inclusive development in the Indo-Pacific region. We prioritise gender equality and social inclusion by encouraging initiatives that focus on development for all groups, women and girls, people with disabilities, older persons and other marginalised groups. These commitments have shaped the ASEAN Australia Smart Cities Trust Fund JESI strategy, which adopts a twin track approach to achieve targets on gender equality and social inclusion within the region. The strategy is applied to each scenario and is currently undergoing a review with the aim of raising the bar on resilience and inclusion. Australia's focus on inclusion is also guided by our development for all strategy for strengthening disability inclusive development. It prioritises disability inclusive development by providing opportunities for people with disabilities to participate on an equal basis with others and realise their full potential. This enables countries to harness the contribution of all citizens, maximising opportunities for poverty reduction and sustainable economic growth. Effectively addressing the needs of those who experience greatest vulnerability, including people with disabilities, provides the bedrock for social cohesion and contributes to a resilient and prosperous region. Development and social inclusion complement each other. We cannot have one without the other. Over the past months, I've observed with interest implementation of the Smart Cities Inclusive Cities Program as part of the broader work of the Trust Fund to drive people-centric smart city development in Southeast Asia. The Inclusive Cities Dialogues, which are at the heart of this program, have brought the elements of gender equality and social inclusion to the fore. In the past few months, over 100 stakeholders were engaged in meaningful discussions to shape future reforms and engagement strategies towards building safer, more resilient and livable cities. The dialogues present hope that with such conversations ongoing, we're moving towards cities that are cognizant of problems and issues of these marginalised groups. 
These dialogues and the event today present a perfect opportunity for realizing the goal of inclusive development, which is effective development. Discussions on this platform will encourage and foster collaboration between various stakeholders, which is critical to bringing about change. I look forward to listening to the smart solutions presented by speakers today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Caroline. And second, we have from the ADB, Wendy Walker, Chief of Social Development Thematic Group, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department. Over to you, Wendy. Thank you. And thank you, um, everybody, for joining uh, this important event today. And I'm so pleased to be here with you. Um, these inclusive city dialogues promoted under the Trust Fund and facilitated by Ramball and the Asia Foundation have been instrumental in exploring how we can transform our cities through the various reform and policy opportunities that can be implemented in the region. They have focused on highlighting opportunities that can be further leveraged, replicated and scaled up to ensure better living conditions and a focus on addressing and enabling social inclusion in urban environments. The dialogues like these validate that the knowledge, the networks, the energy and enthusiasm needed to drive inclusive change um, is also lasting and abounds. So tapping into it and developing and adopting strong mechanisms to ensure that the new ideas and learning from past experience are at the heart, remain at the heart of urban planning and development in the region, and that is the goal. So this uh, initiative is very well aligned with ADB's Corporate Strategy 2030, which has put its um, people and inclusive development at the heart of the agenda and its operational priorities. We have seven different operational priorities which uh, cut across our work and they're designed to work uh, together to achieve our cross-cutting objectives. The first two of the seven focus on developing, re, um, enabling envir environments with actions to address remaining poverty and reduce inequalities, and um, also to accelerate progress in gender equality. And these two areas also are reflected in achieving um, the standalone sustainable development goals and in mainstreaming um, of targets and indicators across the other SDGs. But these first two operational priorities also support and strengthen the fourth one, um, which is on making cities more livable, where social inclusion and gender equality are firmly entrenched um, in the objectives and the action areas. So building cities that consider and design for the needs of all, be they women and girls, uh, persons with disabilities, older people, and other uh, vulnerable and, and marginalized groups has always been and will, and will continue to be a priority of ADB. With more than half of the region's population living in urban areas and more than half of the world's slum dwellers, slum, slum dwellers living in Asia, um, our interventions need to address both the current disparities and inequalities in access to opportunities, and also to anticipate the future with the emergence of new vulnerabilities, uh, such as the ongoing rapid rise in the number of older persons that will shape the social and physical environment needs for the coming years, just one of the, one of the phenomena. So if not well conceptualized and deployed um, digital technologies that support smart and accessible and inclusive cities will play an important role going forward in addressing inclusion and our key areas such as access to services, safety and affordability. Now let me give just a couple of examples of how we're working to drive this agenda internally. As part of that operational priority one, we are strengthening our approach to the poverty and social analysis, which underpins the design of all of our projects. This is integrating new tools and approaches to areas such as community and youth engagement, public participation and social accountability mechanisms, and development of interoperable databases, which link and strengthen social services and urban planning. As part of our new a roadmap to support disability inclusive development, we have embarked um, with the urban sector on a concerted effort to build capacity, demonstrate, and increasingly adapt uh, the power of inclusive design for addressing the needs of persons with disabilities, and in doing so, to better address the needs of all. Uh, we are also developing new kinds of urban investments, such as the recently Improved healthy and age-friendly city development project in Guangxi Zhang Autonomous Region in China, 
which has a component on improving uh, the digital access and literacy of the population, especially older persons, so that they can better access urban and social services. And finally, we are increasingly strengthening the focus and integration of efforts on gender and social inclusion, or JESI, um, such as the framework which has been adopted in our South Asia region um, and is being applied across their program. So today's event is focused on one of the most important development opportunities and challenges in the region and globally, digitalization. And we hope that this seminar will help in facilitating conversations on how we can utilize the rise of digital technologies and smart solutions to act as an enabler to provide better access and livelihood opportunities and improve the lives of all, particularly vulnerable and marginalized groups. And we will be exploring collaborations that can work to drive solutions at the intersection of technology and inclusion, leading us to smart, livable, inclusive and resilient cities. I am also very keen to listen to the discussions today and learn about the various initiatives that are ongoing and that can be replicated and scaled up in the region. So with that very brief introduction, I wish everybody a really stimulating meeting of minds and great ideas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. And thanks to both Wendy and Caroline for getting our event kicked off so well. Uh, we are now well and truly started. Um, and before we move into our two keynote addresses, we do want to share something with you. Uh, we are calling it an inspiration wall. So throughout uh, the rest of this seminar, we'd love to capture your reflections as we go along. And to do so, we've set up a Jamboard. Some of you have used Jamboards before. Uh, you can use it to add ideas and actions that you're inspired by during the session. I think we're gonna see a slide with the Jamboard link coming in a second. So all you need to do is click on the link. It will take you to the Jamboard um, and you're able to fill in the, the pages on the Jamboard uh, in, with whatever language you're comfortable using. Um, you'll see icons on the left with tools. You can use sticky notes, you can use pens uh, to, to share your thoughts. Um, if the page is full, please go to the next board by clicking the icons at the top. Um, and as this will inform our future thinking, we would ask you to add the name of your city in brackets after you add your idea. So you can see there um, what it looks like. And anyone and everyone is welcome to go to the Jamboard at any point during this event and just share your thoughts. And this will be another way, uh, another opportunity for interaction and for, your, for everyone to share uh, the, and interact with the ideas that are being uh, talked about at the time. All right, so with that, we are ready now to move into our keynote addresses. And we have two very inspiring uh, keynote speakers uh, to share with us this morning. The first one is Bapa Haji Muhammad Ramdan Pumanto, the mayor of Makassar City, Indonesia, and a very well-known inclusion champion. The mayor will be speaking in Bahasa Indonesia. So those of you who uh, do not understand Bahasa Indonesia, please go to the interpretation icon, click on English or the language of your choice there. Uh, mayor Pumanto, over to you. Thank Good you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Muhammad Ramdan Pumanto. Everyone call me Dani. Judul kami adalah. The title, our title is Somber and Smart City is a Smart Inclusive City. Okay, uh, next, please. The next slide. All right. Next again. Okay. So we have a concept, digitalization concept called smart city, but we have different concept. We have different concept about smart city. It is called somber, sombre and smart city. Sombre is a regi regional language from Makassar, South Sulawesi, which means approximately in English, uh, great hospitality great humble and also the great brotherhood the reason why we take sombre and a smart city is this is a concept 
of inclusiveness that we bring so that we so that smart city can be acceptable and beneficial for everyone we hope that smart city become part of solution of all obstacles um, taking place in makassar smart city is only related to software and hardware so sombre is hard way about our heart next please so philosophically sombre smart city is how technology how high technology meets high touch so this is the elements of inclusion of makassar city that we are developing today so uh, yes next slide please next slide go on please so the reason why we develop a sombre and smart city concept there are 11 uh, objectives the first is uh, to develop transparent information the second is real-time data the third is a uh, connective uh, how to connect resources in the city of Makassar the fourth is easy to access so to provide easy access for uh, all development programs in all departments and then we also want to reduce cost the six is a quick response seven is data accuracy the eight is adaptive to uh, trends and then the ninth is to customize local characters the tenth is accumulated outcome and then the last is secure system that's uh, our goals so how makassar build a smart city the first is we have a vision our vision is a pro inclusiveness my vision is accelerating makassar as a world-class city with sombre and small value to deliver strong immunities for all for all is the key of the inclusiveness so for all is the key over here while on the other hand our mission is to revolute the quality of human resources and the reform bureaucracy in creating world-class public services that is clear from a corruption the second one is to reconstruct public health socio-economic and cultural life to be able to create prosperous society the third one is to restore city spatial development in creating inclusive and livable city with sombre and smart city the second is public engagement we have one policy so that community group is the front runner of public activities or social inclusiveness we try to strengthen these public groups by uh, providing a monthly incentive based on nine criteria one of the criteria is how to engage the public how they can involve the public to uh, carry on touching heart protocols so they uh, gather so they go out and then ask questions to the society every day to find out how they can accept the vision and mission of the city of makassar the second is we establish a system uh, below this local community group called local influencer this local influencer is called basi barania basi barania is translated as magnet so these people work under this community group and then they provide information directly to the mayor this is done to be able to detect social issues including uh, uh, in problems about inclusion and the third is we have established a 
port of Ali. So we have 8,000 small spaces for Ali and we have 8,000 alleys in the city of Makassar. And then in each alley, we have board of alley, which comprise the most senior citizens and then a female related to gender and then millennials. So the board of alley comprised three elements, three uh, groups, and we hope that this uh, can foster inclusivity in Makassar and to develop uh, the social, economic, and cultural uh, sector in Makassar. The third is the third concept of Sombre and Smart City is we start with useful uh, activities. So we think of how our society can uh, embrace digitalization. So we start with a uh, we start with one program with home care telemedicine. So this has been conducted starting in 2015. Here, the society can make a phone call if they have uh, issues, for example, health issues. So they can call our health, our uh, center 112, and within 15 minutes, um, doctors, fire brigades will uh, come to the house of people having issues. Say, for example, when someone is sick and then they call the call center and then the doctor will come to the house. So we also have a tracking system. So we are able to monitor whether or not the health has arrived to that people. And then we also have a car. Uh, we have tele EKG, tele USG, and then tele spinometry in our car to monitor our patient. Say, for example, a patient has a heart, uh, heart issue, then we will put this EKG machine to that person. We'll attach that machine. And then from this, we can, uh, and then we will have consultation with a cardiologist. So the data from this tele EKG will be sent to the mobile phone of this cardiologist. So this cardiologist will uh, be able to notify the general doctor visiting the house about the treatment um, for this person. This has been uh, done since 2015. Right now, uh, we are improving our telemedicine program and we will have 47 complete telemedicines to take care of all diseases so that um, patient does not have to go to the laboratory, which means that they can be correctly diagnosed at home. So we hope that our Sombre smart city with high touch and high technology can be accepted by the society. We hope that by this smart city concept, we can serve all uh, groups in society, including uh, senior citizens, like what you can see in this picture. Next, please. So the next example is uh, during COVID-19 pandemic. So during pandemic, we have Sombre Smart City concept called Makassar Recovered or a protocol and services against COVID-19. So this is emergency protocols based on Sombre Smart City to fight COVID-19 with the support of society. And thank God with this concept, we are one of the cities that can, that can uh, take care of COVID-19 pandemic. So we have 99% immunity level. So uh, to, as an evidence, we, uh, we do uh, blood sampling and thank God that Makassar has very strong city immunity based on um, laboratory, blood check from the laboratory. So uh, this is three ecosystems we try to develop in Makassar based on Sombre Smart City. First is city immunity, second is social adaptation, and then the third is economic recovery. So uh, right now we have uh, 
right, we have uh, been in the third state, the third stage. So this is um, our war room to be able to monitor the surface in uh, public surfaces in uh, the city of Makassar. So this is our uh, center. And then the fourth is based on our experience, we think of how the Sombres So uh, we want to uh, touch social sector too. Right now, our society, our society has established tourism alley. So this is the initiative of the society. This year, we start with. Okay, uh, next please. So this is the dashboard. So we start with one thousand nineteen five tourism alleys in Makassar and the initiatives is from the public so they determine type of food that they're going to sell type of flowers they are growing in those alleys and this is a concept uh, related to food security and also economic independence and a circular economy this is also related to social cohesion gender smart and smart city preview to this so these are the content in uh, our uh, tourism uh, alley so we have economic recovery culinary empowerment jobs gender small enterprises and startup tourism culture and histories social mitigation urban cells innovation uh, West Bank and Makassar. So uh, this is how, this is the result of our inclusiveness that we develop uh, through technology called Somber and Smart City. Right now we have 1,095 tourism alleys and it's still on progress. And then all issues, including social and gender issues is solved through a city cells called tourism alley. So tourism alley is the city cell here. Next, please. So uh, the, re the outcome is human development index in Makassar increases from 79% to 82.60%. And then satisfaction index increase from 60% to 82.41%. So this is uh, the concept of how to develop Makassar into an inclusive and resilient city using Sombre and Smart City. Hope. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih banyak, Mayor Danny. That was fascinating and your leadership is truly inspirational. Thank you for that opening keynote address. And now we turn to our second keynote address. Uh, from another inspirational speaker, Dr. Wei Yu Zhang. She is an associate professor at the Department of Communications and New Media and the director of the Civic Tech Lab at the National University of Singapore. Her research focuses on civic engagement and ICTs throughout Asia. So over to you, Dr. Wei Yu. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for the very kind uh, introduction. Uh, my great honor and uh, pleasure to be here um, while sharing the virtual floor with um, leaders from the governments, the international organizations, as well as local NGOs. I am particularly excited to see so many Southeast Asian um, members uh, in this virtual room. I'm very glad to connect to you. Um, so um, I'd like to uh, start my sharing today with a question. When are smart cities not smart? Well, uh, I guess the answer is actually already in the title of this event. Um, so smart cities are not smart if they are not inclusive. Okay, I'm going to use a very recent example to illustrate this answer. So a very smart city, um, one of the smartest cities in Southeast Asia, launched a very smart contact tracing 
application in the early days of COVID-19. So this uh, smart technology has won various international awards since its invention. The technology uses Bluetooth, a very common feature on all kinds of smartphones, to trace people who are in close contact with COVID positive cases. So if I was within five meters distance to a COVID positive person, I would receive a message on my phone alerting me about this contact and urging me to stay at home, not spreading the virus. So very smart and very useful, isn't it? Um, however, three months after this smart application was introduced to the public, only 17%, 17% of the population downloaded the mobile application. The challenge is that any contact tracing technologies would not really work unless 70%, 70% of the population use this uh, smart technology. So what can we do now? Um, well, uh, the technologist came out to ensure the public that there are no safety issues, there are no privacy uh, breach associated with this application. Uh, leaders came out to urge the public, the public to uh, use this application and said that lockdowns would not be lifted if we don't hit the magic number, 70%. Still, the adoption speed was slow. Um, some really, really smart technologists thought of an alternative technology, actually not as smart as the first mobile application. So they asked, how about we use this old physical token to do contact tracing? The physical token still uses the same Bluetooth technology, but the token doesn't require any access to your smartphones. So this token looks like your car key, right? With very little aesthetics, I have to say. However, three months after the token was available for free at all community centers, we reached the magic number of 70%. So what do we learn from this story? Uh, I like to say that in order to be smart, we have to be inclusive. It's not just a matter of moral judgment. It's actually a practical strategy. Because when we look at the problem, right, the problem here seems to be very simple, how to fight COVID-19. But there are very different ways of formulating these common problems. For the decision makers, right, uh, the question becomes, well, what's the most effective technology that we could use to solve the problem? Well, uh, the majority of the population use mobile phones, smartphones, and the majority of the population know how to download and operate a mobile application. So maybe a smartphone application is the best answer to the question. However, the majority of the population look at the question in a different way. They ask, what's the least disruptive technology we can use to reach the same goal, right? Which is to uh, trace contacts among COVID cases. Well, uh, does this technology uh, not drain my smartphone battery so quickly? Uh, if this technology doesn't take that much uh, storage space uh, in my phones, right? I would prefer that technology. That's why this uh, physical token seems to be the best answer to that. We are yet to ask an, a question about the minority of the group, of the population. There are still 5% of the population who don't own a smartphone at all, right? Most of these people are the elderly, uh, the migrant workers, children, right? Now, how do we expect them to deal with this question when they don't have the access to the very basics, right? So uh, I like to say that we need to include these, all these different perspectives as early as at the problem formation stage. So uh, that's why um, I like to uh, make a proposal here. I want to propose a two-step deliberation method that we could use to bring these different perspectives as early as possible to the problem solving process. So uh, this method, I want to particularly consider people who are uh, with dis disabilities, women, the urban pool, and other marginalized groups. So um, in an event, in an earlier, 
inclusive city dialogue event, I heard from a local NGO leader, uh, Ms. Ong Biling. So Ms. Ong is a CEO of the Penang Women's Development Cooperation. She discussed their successes in mainstream gender across uh, pro policy making processes. So uh, in their practices, separate dialogues for women and men according to age and ability were organized. As Ms. Ong herself put it, quote, so that all the voices are heard. Otherwise, if you put them all together, only certain voices are heard, end of quote. So I like to say that this two-step deliberation model uh, will be useful to let different voices to be heard. The first step is to let the minority groups start from their own smaller and safer versions of deliberation. So in these more inclusive uh, spaces, uh, minority group members can feel free to discuss their personal experiences. It's totally fine to be highly emotional as well. Uh, but these in-group deliberations do not stop at emotion and experience sharing. Minority groups also have to develop their strategies to reach out and deliberate with a larger society. After that, here comes our second step. Our second step would involve a society-wide deliberation. And here I would actually suggest del deliberations on broad topics, such as the pandemic. We use broad topics uh, that impact all societal members rather than issues which seem to only benefit one portion of the society so that when the minority groups share their experiences and emotions, the sharing will be relevant to the rest of the society. Okay, I'd like to um, well, uh, conclude my sharing today with this uh, quote from my colleague Arun, who wrote about smart uh, cities as early as in 1999. So the final goal of smart cities is not just economic growth, but an enhancement of the quality of life for all people. Right. Uh, I'm going to stop here and I would really like to uh, invite you to reach out and continue the conversation with me after this event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wei-Yu. That was very inspiring, uh, fascinating. I think that both of our keynote speakers have given us already a lot to think about. I hope everyone is going to the Jamboard, to the Inspiration Wall, sharing your thoughts, your reactions, uh, other ideas that you may have that can interact with the, the keynote speakers that we've heard already. Now it's time for us to move into the main body of our event today. Um, we, over the next hour and a half, um, we will be having uh, exposure to an interaction with four inspirational case studies. So we'll, these, sec these sessions will be led by four speakers who are currently leading locally digital and inclusive solutions on improving urban governance. So each of these speakers will have a 20 minute session. Uh, they'll only be speaking for five minutes of those 20 minutes. And the remaining 15 minutes will be a facilitated Q&A and discussion, time for you to interact, and uh, finally time for uh, all of our participants to have a chance to speak, engage, ask questions, and share their own ideas um, on these issues. So we will have four of these. After the first two, we'll have a very short break, five minutes, um, and then we'll have the second, second two speakers. And you can see uh, the four speakers there on your screen. So we'd like to move into the first session. Um, our first speaker and the first session uh, is Sofia Castillo. Sofia is the Director for Climate and Environmental Resilience at Think City, which is an organization based here in Malaysia. She has over 20 years of experience working on environmentally and socially resilient urban design projects globally. Her work in Penang in particular has won multiple awards including the Climathon Global Cities Award in 2020. With that, I'll hand the screen over to you, Sophia, and we look forward to hearing your insights. Thank you so much, Robin. I hope you can hear me well. Very clear, thank you. Wonderful, sorry. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen. Um, okay, so I have, I've, I have only five minutes, so that's, 
very short. I'll be very briefly introducing the Penang program and our inclusive strategies and the digital tools used during the development of the program and created by the program. So the nature-based climate adaptation program for the urban areas of Penang Island was designed by Think City and initiated in 2019. The goal is to use nature-based solutions to reduce climate impact in Penang, reducing threats to human life, infrastructure, and property. Uh, it has a science-driven approach in design and results and six impact assessments. The main challenges are four, heat stress, flooding, social vulnerabilities, and gaps in institutional capacity. Our proposal is to address with four components these four challenges. To use nature-based solutions to reduce urban stress, to, re to use them as well to reduce urban flooding by developing upstream retention and blue green corridors, and to strengthen uh, social resilience among vulnerable communities, youth, and women and girls. And to reinforce institutional capacity by addressing the gaps to create a public health program, to create a knowledge transfer platform, and to create a, a benign climate board. This is just a visualization of the program in Georgetown. This is a visualization of the urban greening components, the nature-based solutions components. So the current status of the program. So in January, 2020, we won the Climate on Global Cities Award, which is given by uh, Climate Kick. In October 2021, we received, uh, we were endorsed to receive $10 million uh, for execution from the Adaptation Fund. And in September 2022, so just last month, we, uh, we had the Inception Workshop, which is the official initiation of the program. In terms of inclusive strategies, you can see here that we have a strong, very strong social resilience component. We are actually, I, I heard several people mention in PWDC, we are working with them. Uh, we are working with several women's groups. So we have, and also youth groups. Uh, so we'll develop a comprehensive vulnerability assessment uh, plan uh, for vulnerable communities with action plans, a specific youth and schools program, and a women and girls program. We have, I have one very interesting insight for you. When we started developing the program, we organized workshops and focus groups and with community leaders, policymakers, remarkable people in Penang. And all of them said the heat was not a problem. Flooding was a problem, all of them. And then we went to the communities to the vulnerable communities with different engagements on site, as you can see here. And what they told us was exactly the opposite. They told us heat was the problem, not flooding. And we asked them, why Are, is not flooding a problem for you? And they said, yes, but it's once a year. Heat is every day. And then we understood that we all as, um, we all are uh, buffered from the impacts of climate change because we live in air-conditioned spaces. Not only I am now working in an air-conditioned office, I use air-conditioned transportation and I have air-conditioned at home. Vulnerable communities are the ones that are more accurate in assessing impacts already taking place. So now for the digital tool. So you, you, we use remote sensing, which is very useful, as you can see here, in terms of uh, remote sensing the data for surface temperatures. You can see here how we can assess also how green spaces are cooler. And we also use remote sensing cameras at ground level, which you can see here. You can see here that the green space is cooler in almost 30 degrees Celsius than a non-green space, for example. And then the digital tools created by the program, I don't have time. So we have three components created. We have a knowledge platform to be created, a climate app, which is a big, big surprise, but I'm not going to talk about it today. And we have the Atlas of Climate Resilient Urban Tree Species, which, which is going to be launched in November 1st. So not only we are vulnerable to climate change, 
but urban tree species are also vulnerable. And when we make the uh, decisions to plant tree species, we are planting them to survive, to live, to have a lifespan of 50 to 80 years. So we need to account, to make informed choices for future-oriented urban forest management. So this is uh, an example. This is going to be this Atlas of Climate Resilient Trees is going to be launched on November 1st, as I said. It's sponsored by the Monetary Prize of the Climate Zone Award. Here it is, Climate Kick. We sponsored it. And in conclusion, vulnerable communities must be the focus of adaptation projects, not only because they are going to be more impacted, but also because they are much more aware. They are great. Um, we need to start all programs by engaging them because they are the most acutely aware um, people, uh, demographics regarding the impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. Second, digital tools can be crucial uh, to develop projects, but only in a supporting role. We are in a climate and in biodiversity crisis, and we must put all our efforts in restoring and supporting nature. And digital tools can be very useful in support for this, and also to support uh, social uh, vulnerabilities. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't speak too much. Please contact me where if you have any doubts. I'll share my contacts also in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, that was really interesting. And I'd like to invite my colleague, Nicola Nixon, who's the Asia Foundation's Director for Governance, to join us to facilitate this session with you. Over to you, Nicola. Thanks very much, Robin. Thank you. Look, thanks so much, Sophia. Uh, that was that was a fascinating and so information packed um, presentation. Um, I'm gonna. I'm hoping that we will get some some questions. Um, I'm gonna open it up to the floor for questions, for comments, for observations. And as we usually find with Zoom, I might sort of pause for a moment or two while people collect their thoughts and see whether. There's someone from the floor who would like to comment or ask a question. I'll just give it a moment. Oh, and let me just put the chat on. All right, well, perhaps while, while people then are collecting their thoughts. Sophia, so much in that, in that presentation. Um, I, I, a few, I loved your points about the, the idea that vulnerable groups are you know the, the most acutely aware so it's it's again this this question of it's not just a moral issue of engaging with particular communities as we heard from um, Professor Wei Yu as well but it's also about the accuracy of the data that you're collecting I think that's a really really important point um, and this idea also that digital tools then play a supporting role that they're really important but they aren't the first necessarily the first consideration of the the work that you're doing. I'm thinking, you know, for, for representatives who are here from other cities across Southeast Asia, um, I'm just wondering about your experience in or your reflection when you've had an opportunity to reflect on the potential for replication for the work that you're doing in Think City mm -hmm. across other cities in Southeast Asia who might be in different um, situations in terms of the environmental impact of climate change or different socioeconomic conditions. Could you share some thoughts with us on, on that? Yes, thank you very much for that question, Nicola. Um, I'm so sorry because at, at my presentation had too many, <laughs> too much information. So there's so much to that needs to be detailed. Um, so the knowledge transfer platform is precisely focused on transferring our framework, not only to other cities in Malaysia, but across the region. Um, so actually, we have a budget, a substantial budget from the Adaptation Fund uh, for it, and a part of it, we'll call, we are calling it the active knowledge transfer. So we'll uh, invite other cities in the region, not only in Malaysia, for workshops to actively seek to share the strategies, and very important, Nicola, to share the assessment of impacts. 
because in Asia, sometimes there's some, I, I find here, both in Malaysia and in China, where I work, there's some reluctancy in uh, accepting uh, things that didn't go so well. But actually, it's when we make mistakes that we learn the most. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, we were going to plant trees, different species of trees in different in different streets with different orientations, north, south, southeast. Obviously, we will find that some species in some orientations will cool better the cities. Mm -hmm. So in the end, the goal of sharing the assessment of impacts is that all other projects can be better developed than ours because they can learn from it. Also, another thing I need to say is that we strongly believe in climate finance and the, the sharing between the countries who cause the climate crisis and the developing world. So we really, we are also willing to support other cities to apply for international finance because um, that is the fairness and that needs to be addressed. I'm not so much, you know, right now we're talking about reparations also because of Pakistan, but we need to, to prepare and developed uh, nations, particularly the ones who are more responsible for the carbon emissions, for historical carbon emissions, must provide developing nations with the finance necessary for preparedness. Thanks, Sophia. That's a really important point as well. Um, so I, I can see that there's a couple of questions coming in uh, through the chat. Um, and I did want to mention also to all of the participants at the moment, please, if you have questions for other speakers, um, uh, Professor Wei Yu or, or Danny, the Mayor of Marcusa, please also uh, yes. don't hesitate to put those questions or comments in the chat or raise your hand so that you can ask the question directly. Um, I see that somebody, uh, Dr. Malini Reddy has her hand up. Please thank go you, ahead. Donna. Uh, thank you, Sophia, for the lovely presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, wanted to understand uh, uh, from your study as well as your work, uh, have you come across situations where members belonging to vulnerable groups are living in highly um, uh, areas which are prone to flooding and other climate effects, have they expressed any strong desire to, you know, take things in their control, particularly in terms of predictive uh, measures or alert systems? Is there any demand from them that we would like to be aware and we need tools to be able to communicate with each other during times of distress? Thank you very much for that question. It's a, it's a very good question. Uh, actually, vulnerable groups almost always live in flood prone areas uh, because um, high end um, high end neighborhoods are never located in flood prone areas. Also, uh, high end neighborhoods or middle class neighborhoods always have more green spaces than uh, low income communities. So they are also less vulnerable to heat. Uh, we have found there are already adaptive, uh, some adaptive uh, strategies, but usually the strategies are related to furniture. They're adapting the furniture. However, I have uh, uh, good news and it's very aligned with what you said. The knowledge transfer platform we are creating with the, the money from the adaptation fund, we've decided to print, print, uh, transform it from the platform, an online platform for the Penang program, but for all adaptation strategies in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So we will soon have a platform that will share these small strategies, not only from different organizations developing adaptation projects, but strategies adopted by people. Mm -hmm. In to, to be very clear regarding your question, in Penang for flooding, citizens are adapting furniture by elevating it and so on. Thank you, Sophia. Okay, we have a couple more questions um, coming through on the chat. We have actually, we have someone who's um, 
working on how to use trees for city cooling in Laos. Um, I'm wondering, Sengdara, do you want to tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing? Yes, it's actually my expertise, my background, my original background is landscape architecture, and then I have postgraduate degrees in uh, project management and climate change. Um, so actually, we using strategically planting urban green spaces, particularly street trees, can reduce urban temperatures between two and eight degrees Celsius. And this is because we are nullifying the urban heat island effect. We are not reducing climate change, that's impossible. We are reducing the urban heat island effect. We are reducing the, the heat, uh, hot materials absorb heat from solar radiation and withhold it. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the first step. This is something that everyone in the field and landscape architects know very well about it. But we've went one step further, which is searching for the trees that will withstand future changes in climate. And I encourage you to do the same. Very recently, when we initiated the study, there were only two research, uh, international research on this. Since then, several papers came out, one from Nature magazine, which stated that more than 70% of tree species, urban tree species, will have problems in surviving urban habitats by 2050. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to also look at um, the choice of the tree as of the tree species that you're um, planting. Thanks, Sophia. We, we have one more question then just quickly from uh, Thailand, from Muan Pong. Um, do you use scenario-based planning with vulnerable communities and how has it been received? wishing to unpack the likely impact it may have on them uh, in the future can be challenging, but important. Um, that's a very good question, but I must say that we have not been using that so far. Mm -hmm. With, so far, so the program was launched in September before we were just engaging the, uh, the doing community engagements to assess uh, impacts. But our social uh, vulnerability, our social vulnerability experts, they are a bit, a little bit reluctant in doing that. Um, so I'm not sure because they say vulnerable communities are overwhelmed, and PWBC also says this. They are overwhelmed with their vulnerability. They don't need to be told what they're going to suffer yet even more in the future. So this is something we need to be cautious. I'm not sure how we're going to do it, um, but it is an issue that needs to be addressed because we need to inform people, right? So. Sophia, thank you so much. There's more comments coming on the chat, but mindful of the time, I'm going to hand back to Robin for our next presenter. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sophia, and thank you, Nicola, for that expert facilitation. Um, again, lots of opportunities to engage with all of these speakers through the chat on the Jamboard. Uh, please avail yourself. And now we are moving to our second 20-minute session with our second speaker, Robert C., who is a sustainability mobili sustainable mobility advocate. Uh, he's also a columnist for Mobility Matters with the Manila Times and the advisor and co-convener of Move as One Coalition. Robert brings with him decades of experience in government, multilaterals, academia, and civil society, and he holds a PhD in city and regional planning from Cornell University. Over to you, Robert, for this session. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sir Robin, and uh, please uh, allow me to uh, share my screen. Let's see if I can get this all to work. Uh, let's see. Can, can people see my screen? Maybe not yet. Let's try again. Uh, can people see anything? Okay, let me start. Okay. So good morning, uh, friends and fellow advocates. My name is Robert C. and I'm with the Move Us One Coalition. And uh, today what we'd like to talk about is 
how Movus One has been able to use tech to push its advocacy for sustainable mobility. So it's about using uh, smart tools to advocate for smart and inclusive cities. So when we talk about a smart and inclusive city, the image that I see is that of a city where everyone can move around efficiently and safely without need for a private car. And today, unfortunately, many cities are what we would call car dependent, mainly because the conditions for walking, cycling, and public transport are poor or inadequate. And this is what the Move Us One Coalition is trying to change. And how do we push for change? We build partnerships with government and the private sector. We, we lobby for better policies, budgets, and legislation. We conduct research and prepare policy notes on the most press, pressing issues. And we try to raise awareness, share knowledge, and change mindsets. So in doing all this, tech has been a very useful tool, especially during the pandemic, enabling us to communicate regularly without significant cost and to get the message across to a larger audience. So one of the me important messages that we put out and we try to echo at every opportunity is that mobility is a basic need and a human right. So when a person is unable to travel safely and efficiently, that person is denied their basic rights and their ability to access jobs and, and essential services like health and education. Uh, let, so how have we, uh, what have we achieved in, in the last uh, two to three years of our existence? And I'd like to talk a little bit about that to give you a flavor of what we've pushed for. So when public transportation is insufficient or not accessible, walking and cycling offer low cost health promoting and environmentally friendly options. And so we need to make walking and cycling safe and attractive in all our cities. So one of our successes was the uh, campaign to get a, a budget from our national government, equivalent to about 66 million US dollars in public funding to create active transport infrastructure in major cities. So up until now, there had been negligible public spending on proper sidewalks and bike lanes. So getting this uh, pushed in uh, big cities like Cebu, Davao, and Metro Manila was one of the things we worked together on together with our national agencies and local governments. Another important initiative that we pushed in the last few years was uh, this tool or concept called service contracting. So service contracting is uh, a different business model for delivering public transport services. So it became a tool for the Philippine government to sustain public transport services while keeping fares affordable. Paying transport operators for delivering services enabled them to survive uh, during the difficult period of the pandemic. Legislators were able to provide over $200 million equivalent in service contracting budgets during 2021 and 2022 to enable drivers and public transport operators to maintain their services despite difficult conditions on the ground. So how did we build this coalition and how did we get into this work? And maybe I can uh, talk a little bit about this. Although travel conditions in the Philippines have been problematic for a very long time, 
the situation became a real uh, emergency and crisis during the pandemic. Many public transport operators went bankrupt, people were unable to travel, and many lost jobs and their businesses went under. We launched uh, early on a change.org petition. Uh, so a group of us, mobility advocates, got together and we constructed a change.org petition and put this out, highlighting the crisis and presenting specific recommendations. And this was the genesis of our Move Us One coalition. We used the change.org platform to deliver our message and to find like-minded organizations and individuals. And we were uh, quite uh, uh, amazed also by the response. It attracted 140 organizations and over 77,000 individuals who signed up to that petition and shared our vision for better mobility. So they became the base for the coalition, and this was our start. Today, one of our strengths is that the coalition includes many different kinds of stakeholders. Our partners and volunteers include transport industry workers, urban and transport planners, public transport users, bicycle organizations, environmental advocates, students and youth, and organizations of persons with disabilities, as well as the business and private sector. Now, given also the constraints of the pandemic, we had to use social media to reach a wider audience. And this is what we've uh, come to use and learn how to use uh, quite efficiently and effectively. And so from the time the coalition was launched in mid-2020, we have used both Facebook and Twitter as our main social media platforms to reach our audience and stakeholders. We try to create awareness and uh, share information using our social media channels. A big part of our advocacy is putting out uh, posters and infographics like this for our social media engagement. We also organize uh, many events that bring together civil society, government uh, champions, and private sector partners. So this is one example of what we have done during World Car Free Day recently. And we use apps like Viber and Facebook Messenger to facilitate informal communication and information sharing among many different actors. And so having these uh, informal channels is actually a very uh, important uh, role that we play in building these bridges, informal bridges between different actors. So planning for these events helps to build trust and productive working relationships that are so valuable in pushing for innovation and policy change. Feeling the public pulse. So we also use social media to help reach our stakeholders and to understand their sentiments and reactions to recent developments, whether uh, policy decisions, new rules, or new uh, events. So by sharing and cross-posting material of our partner organizations, we can expand our influence and we reach a larger audience. So we also use our social media platforms to echo the messages and uh, different announcements of our uh, different partners. 
social media is also uh, an important opportunity to educate ourselves and to understand different points of view, especially how different groups perceive and diagnose our mobility problems. So uh, we uh, regularly go through, for example, the comments uh, sections on social media to understand how different stakeholders perceive what is going on. And this is one way we feel also the pub public pulse using tech and social media. So uh, it's always important to uh, have evidence-based uh, approaches and uh, to better understand and describe our mobility environment, having up-to-date information is crucial. So tech provides new and efficient tools for data collection, especially with the growing number of Filipinos who have smartphones and access to the internet. A survey can be constructed, for example, using Google Forms and circulated via email or social media using a link or QR code, and this is one approach that we have used uh, to generate and provide useful information about travel needs and the experience of Filipinos in cities. We also use tech a lot in our recruitment and capacity building. And one of the programs that we are very proud of is something that we call the Young Mobility Leaders Program. Since 2021, we have been recruiting young volunteers uh, through an on program uh, called the Young Mobility to equip uh, young people with knowledge, skills, contacts, and strategies for promoting sustainable mobility in their own communities. And because the program is online, we have been able to attract advocates from all over the Philippines and to expand our volunteer networks to all parts of the country. So today, national and local government agencies are even targeting our graduates, the graduates of our program, in their recruitment of staff. So I think this is a, uh, in a way, a stamp of approval on the effectiveness of this type of program for building uh, more advocates in our communities. Uh, finally, we use social media a lot to recognize public officials and also legislators who support our cause and advocacies. And when we see policymakers supporting our causes, we give them credit and shine a light on their good messages and good initiatives. And our hope is that these public officials, you know, by uh, broadcasting uh, these messages also on social media, we hope that this action, this uh, approach will incentivize them, will motivate them to continue to champion sustainable mobility in their public statements and decisions. So that's pretty much what I, I'd like to share uh, this morning. And we would very much welcome uh, your uh, feedback and your suggestions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. That was very impressive what you've managed to do in the Philippines. We have about five minutes now for questions. So I'd like to invite my colleague Sumaya Saluja from our governance team to join the group and facilitate uh, this session. So Sumaya. Thank you, Robin. I, similar as before, we have a little less time this time for some Q&A, but would invite uh, people to use the chat function and put in your question or reflection or just raise your hand. As we pause to do so, maybe I'll ask the first, uh, just the first reflection more than a question is, 
I think what I'm so struck by is how simple the tools are that you've been using. So it's looking at social media, Viber, but just the you effective use and the smart use of them to be able to build a diverse coalition, incentivize uh, government partners, but then also build a network of uh, people who are working towards this uh, uh, collectively, not just in Metro Manila, but expanding it beyond. Maybe one of the questions I would ask is, what is your sense of how much COVID has played a role in bringing more people online? And do you think it where do you think it's got us to, as uh, Dr. Zhang put it, to are we getting close to the 70% uh, or we still need to do a bit more to bring more people in um, when we are using digital solutions? Yeah, thanks for that question, Sumaya. Definitely COVID uh, has had a silver lining in the sense that it's pushed us to uh, first uh, uh, create, you know, uh, or build bridges among like-minded advocates. So using uh, social media and tech, we've been able to find like-minded champions all over uh, the Philippines, in government, in the private sector, in civil society. And today, this is what we need in order to push for change. We, 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 we see many, many, uh, uh, in a way, uh, barriers, but what gives us hope is that there are many who share our vision and trying uh, and and uh, giving them the message that they are not alone is so important, especially champions within government. So uh, this is really the power that I see uh, in in using uh, tech and in building also on the the wins that we've made uh, during the pandemic and carrying that across in the post-pandemic period. All right, I think we're really close to the end, but we do have a really insightful question on how do you build agreement on cohesive messaging or objectives when your network is 140 organizations and 77,000 individuals? I think this may also require you to share your entire strategy with us, but uh, just maybe one example um, would be really helpful. Well, um, in a way, what we've put out earlier, uh, is a, a simple vision of uh, how we can make our societies more livable and inclusive. And it has to do with um, building environments where all of us, everyone, however, uh, your status, your economic status or your physical ability can move around uh, safely, conveniently, uh, efficiently, uh, to do whatever you need to do. And I think all of us share that. So it's really about uh, uh, finding uh, first, uh, you know, a common vision and uh, communicating that, and also finding what we would call win-win uh, solutions. We need to find win-win solutions so that everyone will see uh, you know, that they have a stake in moving in that direction. So that's what we always look for in whatever we do. Thank you so much. Back to you, Robin. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Robert, and great questions. Um, I see there's more questions in the chat. Um, Robert, you might uh, wanna address them there if you have a moment. It is now uh, break time, folks, uh, five minutes. Stretch your legs, stand up, grab a drink. Uh, don't forget to add something to the inspiration wall. We will reconvene for the last two speakers in five minutes time. See you then.
All right, welcome back everyone. Hope you're refreshed and ready for two more very interesting speakers. Um, I would ask both speakers to please, if you can, try to keep your uh, presentations to five to seven minutes so that we do have time for questions. We're getting a lot of great questions and uh, from the audience, uh, some in the chat, and I know people are eager to engage with you. So first up here, we've got Ben-Hur Pintor. Uh, he's the Chief Technology Officer at Smart CT, which is an openness and citizen-centric tech nonprofit that he co-founded. He also established BNHR.xyz, boy, say that three times fast, an open data and open geospatial enterprise. In his work, he aims to create a movement that transforms the way that we think, do, and plan smart cities and communities. Over to you, Ben. Thank you. Uh, let me just grab the screen. There we go. Um, I hope everyone can see the screen and can hear me well. Um, yes. Hi, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, thank you for taking the time to spend with us to attend this event. I'll be talking about smart cities open by design and citizen-centric approach to building smart communities. Um, brief outline representation, quick note about myself, about what smart city is, and uh, some introductions to some of the projects and initiatives that we've done or are currently doing related to smart city or inclusive development. Right. So yeah, my name is Ben. I'm based in the Philippines. I have mostly work uh, at the intersection of the openness data geospatial and technology fields. As mentioned, I'm the co-founder and CTO for Smart City, but I also currently serve as the data training lead for the Open Knowledge Foundation. Uh, we are an international not-for-profit organization advancing open knowledge as a design principle. And yeah, I'm also the proprietor and um, founder of BNHR, an open data and open geospatial consulting here in the Philippines. So most of my work, um, for the past decade or so has been around the open community. And there's been a lot of talk about also inclusion in the open communities. I've worked in open data, open contracting, of course, open geospatial and open mapping. And I bring that to, um, I bring that to smart city. Smart city, as far as we know, we're the first tech nonprofit whose focus really is the smart cities field. What differentiates us from other outfits or organizations in the field, especially in the Philippines, is we're a tech nonprofit, but we, we don't focus on the tech, right? Uh, our focus is on a movement. We want to transform how we think, do, and plan smart citizen communities. We do this by using a co-developed and very citizen-centric approach that puts op openness and citizens at the heart of smart city development. Making smart cities open, that has, that has always been our goal. And for something to be open, of course, it has to be accessible. And for it to be accessible, it has to be inclusive. One of the main foundations of our philosophy uh, is that people should have a shared understanding of, of key concepts about smart and sustainable cities so that they aren't left behind, right? Everyone should have at least a basic understanding of what do we mean when we say you know, smart, smart, what do we mean when we say sustainable? What do we mean when we say inclusive, right? We believe that everything or not everything needs to be high tech. An offline first and low tech approach is often more accessible to more people than a high tech one. Um, a saying that we, we go by is that a simple tool that many can use is better than a complex tool that only a few can master, which is why one of our projects that we created was an easy to use and easy to understand tool about fundamental concepts of smart and data-driven local governments. We call it the getting started with being smart and data-driven for LGU's card kit. 
as with most of our work, it is open source. Uh, it's on our GitHub account. Everyone is encouraged to use, adapt, and extend the tool. We did this tool in partnership with the Friedrich Newman Nauman Foundation. Uh, it's basically a card kit made up of a card set and a guidebook with examples on how to use the cards. So in terms of the card set, we have two main types. The first one is what we call building block cards. Uh, these refer to most commonly recurring elements and features that data-driven organizations and smart cities have. Like what is it about uh, data literacy? What is open data, right? What is smart city? They can be combined and connected together with our getting started cards to encourage creative playing and even the shaping of ideas. Speaking of the second type of card, which is our getting started cards, this give a practical overview and guidance on how to get started with being smart and being data-driven for local governments. For example, they can give you information on how to proceed with projects related to disaster data, projects related to data literacy, and even projects related to open data. They provide this set of tools on how you can be smart and how you can start being you know, data-driven. We've also introduced different kinds of scenarios in our guidebook, right? For process, understand what the ideas involved, and even share their own. Um, last, uh, another project we have is Mapa Tanda. It's a portmanteau of Mapa and Tanda, which can mean older adult or remember in, the, in Filipino. It's a project that seeks to improve the number and quality of uh, data in OpenStreetMap that are relevant to older adults. For those of you who are familiar with OpenStreetMap, it's the free and open map of the world. Um, the Philippines has a very vibrant and diverse community of open source geospatial and open source mapping. We tackle issues related to LGBT rights, safe spaces for women, mental health awareness, youth participation, inclusive mapping, etc. So Mapatanda is one of the youngest communities there, although we, we cater to resolving issues related to older people. And yeah, looking back into our philosophy of having this shared understanding of fundamental concepts and using open source tools, our capacity building projects and trainings focus a lot on data literacy, not, not high level data science, but literacy, the foundational knowledge and concepts needed for people to understand how data affects them and how, you know, how data is used in the modern world and the digital world, um, su such as our data literacy for climate and disaster risk governance. And we also utilize a lot of open source tools. We have open geospatial trainings and capacity building activities for, for people um, focusing on open source because they don't need to buy the software. It's very accessible. So lastly, the challenge that we've learned or the challenge and what we've learned so far, one, be open by design. The future is free and open, right? Be open in your processes, in your data and in the tools that you use. Like if you collect data and it's just going to be you that who's gonna use it, then you're, you're basically making a silo. So for us, the tools that we create, the data that we collect, we always try to make it open. And of course, um, respecting data privacy and data ethics, right? For open source is reusable, replicable and fixable. It democratizes technology. It avoids dependency on proprietary donors or vendors. It gives people a seat at the table, basically, right? Um, and then build communities. You can start your own, you can join, or you can participate in uh, local open communities and inclusive communities. We've tried doing that in Smart City, uh, engage with people, because the more people are aware, the stronger the voice, the stronger the movement, until we actually hit critical mass, right? Uh, but that's not enough. Building communities is not enough. You have to build inclusive communities. Don't gatekeep. Uh, don't gatekeep. There's a diversity and inclusion problem in tech and in digital spaces. So we have to accept that. Um, we need, you know, to make it make sure that it's safe and easy for everyone to join and participate in these spaces. Because yeah, we need more perspectives from women, from indigenous people, 
from members of marginalized groups, from members of the LGBTQI plus community in our digital initiatives. Right? Uh, a singular perspective will not, will not cut it anymore, which is why we're really thankful for our past and present partners who've given us um, a, lot of, a lot of support and also a lot of perspectives in terms of uh, how, to, how, to, how to do these solutions that we've done. Um, yeah, and with that, thank you very much for, uh, for listening. You can find me and Smart City online at these links. And if you have questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to address them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Some great tools there and some great insights. We do have about 10 minutes for uh, questions and discussion. And I'd like to invite my colleague, Tamara Failer, uh, Deputy Country Representative to Laos, uh, to join us to facilitate this uh, discussion session. Tamara. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, so I look forward to uh, a vibrant discussion following that very interesting and detailed and uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, I see we have a question in the chat from, from Hillary, the Asia Foundation. I think if, please, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. So um, Hillary says, being tech savvy and being inclusive use different skills. The former uses logic and the latter uses sensitivity and empathy. While you work on these projects, how do you usually have to tweak your way of thinking as a tech person to be an all-rounded tech person? And actually this relates to a question that I had, which is I would love to hear from you, Ben, about when you mentioned those tools, you gave us a few examples of tools. You know, How do you also tweak or refine those tools um, and how do you gather sort of feedback or input from those targeted end users on whether those tools are appropriate to their needs. I think that is sort of a related question. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that question. That's, uh, those are both wonderful questions. Uh, and yeah, something that I would, I would love to address. Uh, one, yeah, well, uh, one, in terms of like changing the way I think, I've been really, I've been very blessed that uh, even though I started from a very technical background, um, an engineering degree, a master's in engineering degree, I've worked for the past six or seven years in a very holistic environment. Uh, when I started with um, a fellowship with School of Data, wherein our focus really wasn't about you know tech solutions, it's about community solutions, and that changed a lot the way I perceive you know, how to solve problems. I don't think that everything needs to be an engineering solution anymore, that there has to be, you know, a collective way um, to, to approach a problem and not just from the perspective of a, an engineer, a data scientist, um, which is why I've, our community has been a really big uh, thing for the past few years in terms of trying to look for these um, kinds of solutions. So yeah, my, my thinking has changed a lot um, it's not as um, it's not as uh, focused on engineering solutions as it was at the start of probably my career a few years ago. Um, so for me, what what does help? And I think for for other people who are uh, who are purely you know doing technical work and who wants to have a more holistic perspective, working with different kinds of people is always like the best way to do it. I've worked with people from like social sciences, from humanitarian. Uh, from the humanitarian and development and aid sector and they always be open to you know their their ideas and their their perspectives because yeah not everything not everything is an engineering solution not everything is a tech solution uh and number two uh about uh, about these um about the solutions that we did we, we actually try as much as we can to utilize um very user-centered or human-centered design approaches like for the for the card kit we initially uh, had several consultations and conversations with DILG Region 4 in the Philippines, the Depart Department of Local and Interior Government, and also some of their, to, to get feedback from some of their uh, chief local executives on you know, what topics do you want to better understand and what kinds of processes are you, are you interested in, in learning more. Um, so those kinds of approaches are, are, are what we try to embody in, in the projects that we do. Um, and of course, in, in our trainings, for example, we, we try not to have cookie cutter trainings. Every time we do training and capacity building, there's always a needs assessment at the start. And we pattern 
where we change the content of the training and how we do the training and capacity building based on the needs of the audience, based on, um, based on what they tell us in terms of what they want. So we tailor, we try to tailor uh, our approaches to different people who, who, need, uh, who need our help, for example. Great, thank you. We also have a, a good question from Zhang in the chat. She says, I know that open source communities are active in the region, but the communities tend to be grassroots. Despite that, many of the free and open source software tools are used by commercial partners. How do we sustain the free and open source software movement when being open does not bring the community much financial benefits? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so this is this is has always been a, a problem, I think, with uh, trying to sustain um, free and open source communities. Um, of course, there's no problem with, uh, no one, there's no problem with uh, earning income from free and open source software. That's one thing that we should, uh, we should tell other people so that they, they're not afraid of using uh, open source stuff. The second is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Zhang, um, commercial partners, some of them do give back and support the community but i think we need yeah we need more ways so that you know these commercial partners especially big entities who utilize a lot of the foundational open source technologies that we have um, actually you know support uh, not just financially but also trying to grow the community and supporting the community itself uh, i know in, i'm not familiar with all geospatial pro all open source projects but in the geospatial field, like we have a lot of support for uh, from from big companies around the foundational uh, libraries such as Jidal um, that are used by not just open source projects but also commercial projects. Um, so one of the ways would be yeah connecting with these commercial entities, um, uh, asking them to you know you're using this why not support it. I know a lot of organizations who, all, who do this. My consulting business does this. I, I donate back to the QGIS project every year. Um, and a lot of the local, local organizations and, or well, the local communities, not real organizations, the local communities um, in the Philippines do so as well. But yeah, um, sustainability is always going to be um, uh, an issue, which is why lastly, I think having uh, it's great to have these grassroots movements because they're very inclusive in terms of the, who, who are involved, but it's also good to have a global organization that uh, helps foster these communities. So like in the Open Geospatial field, we have the Open Geospatial Consortium, we have the Open Street Map Foundation, we have, uh, we have uh, Phos4G, for example, which can provide support from the global, uh, from the global to the local so that it's not just up to the local communities to try to sustain themselves because it's yeah it's it's very difficult and it's really hard to try to sustain like a local community just by yourself especially as you mentioned sometimes uh, a lot of people don't see the value in investing in in open source or free and open source software Thanks, Ben. Um, we're running out of time but there was a quick question that I missed earlier um, so Jowl asked about how many cities across Southeast Asia are involved with smart city. So maybe you can quickly answer that and we can close. Yeah, um, we're, we're, we're rebuilding our network. So mostly before we are just based on the Philippines, uh, but when the pandemic happened, uh, we couldn't go to the provinces, for example, because we're focusing on low income municipalities uh, and cities. So we decided to expand the network. So uh, next year we're opening it to more uh, cities outside of the Philippines, but for right now, we're partnered with uh, DILG Region 4A um, and also local local government units like uh, the municipality of Arteche uh, in in Samar. Um, and yeah, our focus really isn't our focus isn't the high high income cities because they already have all the high tech stuff. Our our mission is to help you know fifth class, sixth class municipalities not get left behind in in this open and smart city revolution that we're having. So if you're something like that, and if you want to uh, join us, feel free to contact me. Next year, we're, we're expanding uh, everything to be a more regional 
uh, alliance and not just something that's based in the Philippines. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Ben. That's a great invitation um, to, to all of the uh, participants on this, uh, on this show. And um, really appreciate that session, Tamara and Ben, very insightful. All right, we are now, uh, I would like to invite our fourth speaker uh, to the screen, Patrick He. Patrick He is the Chief Executive Officer at Engineering Good, which is a Singapore-based organization. In an increasingly digital world, Patrick sees access to technology as the social leveler. And in response, he's dedicated his work to enabling access to technology for disadvantaged communities. Over to you, Patrick. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. I uh, just want to say thank you for taking the time out uh, to spend with us today. And thank you to Eka, who's been signing nonstop uh, since the session started two hours ago. All right, I'm just going to share my screen. Is everybody able to see? Yes. Okay, right. So uh, I'm back from a good base in Singapore. Uh, really, our goal is to empower the vulnerable through technology. Are you able to see what's going on? Yes. So. Yes. It's not in presentation mode, yes. but we can see the slides. Yes, we can see. That's very hard. Why is it not at the correct screen? Able to see it now? Not yet. Okay. Uh, yes. All right, great. Yes. Thank you. So, sorry. Uh, Patrick from Engineering uh, based in Singapore. And our goal is really to solve technology. Um, and to that end, we actually run two programs. Uh, to support two uh, groups of beneficiaries that we work with, uh, namely the low income families through digital inclusion and to empower students with disability technology. Uh, I'll run through uh, some of the programs that we have uh, under those umbrellas. Uh, today, I'm going to be focusing mainly on digital inclusion. I will talk a bit more about uh, assistive technology, but in view of time, the focus will be on digital inclusion today. All right, uh, starting with assistive technology, our belief is really uh, moved by these two sentences, right? So for people without disabilities, technology makes things easier. For people with disabilities, technology makes things possible. And to that end, what we what we do is to run three different services. Uh, one is uh, bespoke programs, uh, projects. So with persons with disabilities, what we see is that uh, disabilities are any and within each disability, uh, there exists a spectrum. Uh, so assistive tech, uh, assistive devices, they are readily available in the market today, will require some amount of customization to fit to the individual use of these people. So that's one service we provide. Uh, secondly, we also run workshops and a maker space where we invite people, uh, persons with disabilities, our volunteers, our communities to come down, learn about the uh, Assistive, uh, accessible design, assistive technology, as well as have a space to the, with the tools to, to hack devices, to take them apart, to figure out how they work, and to customize assistive tech solutions for persons with disabilities. Lastly, with, uh, we have this program called Tech for Good. I just completed it earlier this year on the 1st of October. Basically, how this works is that, uh, and through all our uh, assistive uh, tech programs, we work with persons with disabilities, the communities that serve them, the charities that work with them to understand problem statements. Uh, these problem statements are issues that persons with disabilities face on a day-to-day -day, uh, in school, at work, at home. And we derive uh, tech solutions to help them cope with these challenges that they have to enable and to empower them to live, lead more fulfilling lives. 
So in Tech for Good, what we do is take these problem statements and present them to the youth, uh, 15 to 25 year olds, who spent three months uh, thinking about the problem, speaking with persons with disabilities and designing solutions around these problems. And at the end of the, the three month process, they, uh, they have a demo day, a festival where they get to showcase their work, uh, where persons with disabilities are able to, to see the prototypes that they have, try them out and give more feedback. Uh, Tech for Good is really to, to develop solutions that are with disability can use as well as uh, to foster uh, understanding and empathy among the young people who will be technologies of tomorrow or the issues with persons with disabilities and to understand how assessive this accessible design and, and assistive technology works. In the sense of this, this came out from uh, Tech for Good this year. So, Patrick. Yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. It's mm. difficult to hear you. It seems to be a little unstable. Your uh, voice is going in and out a bit. Um, mm. Perhaps maybe going off video just for the presentation and then for the discussion, you could come back on. Sorry, it's hard to actually understand. Very sorry to interrupt. Sorry, uh, Robin, what were you saying again? I lost you there. That's much better. No. Yes. We, we, we couldn't hear you. <laughs> Oh, okay. Connection issues. So sorry about that. All right. So uh, this uh, is a particular device that was created for persons with visual disabilities. Uh, the problem presented to us is how do they measure liquid volume? Uh, and in the case of, let's say, how do I measure 5 ml of cough syrup, right? So as you see the photos, uh, on the left, there is a syringe. And basically what you do is to pull the plunger and you use the markers here, each one, each mark is two ml, right? To, to gauge how much uh, liquid is drawn. And then when you press the plunger, you get the desired uh, amount of liquid that you have, that you want. This one is a bed rotation system. Most hospital beds and uh, raise up your heads or your feet. Uh, and this was designed the problem statement given to us was from persons uh, who are bedridden and they need assistance from caregivers to rotate them to prevent bed sores. So what we really were looking for was a solution that rotates the bed uh, sideways or laterally. And this was how it looks like. So this is the first, very first prototype that we have uh, put in place. Uh, it's currently going through user testings and through the data that we get, we will look at refining the, the product and having it uh, once, bringing it to a stage where it's able to be in hospitals, in hospice cares, and even in homes of people all over the country and in, in the world if possible. All right, so that's our assistive technology work. Uh, Next, we look into digital inclusion. And for this, uh, our guiding principles are for people with the means, technology is a lifestyle, uh, lifestyle choice, right? We're looking at you know, which latest phone to get, uh, what tablets we want, uh, what specs do we want for our laptops. However, for people without the means, technology enables them uh, to, ac to access opportunities. How this work came about is really through COVID. Uh, I took this from a UNICEF website. Basically, they're saying that in 2020, the first year of the COVID, uh, 168 million children were absent from school. Uh, the problem isn't as large as in Singapore. Uh, we have the adequate resources put in place to access learning from home through laptops and technology and tablets. However, uh, a group was excluded from this because they have no access to technology. This being the community that, uh, from the low income community that we have here in Singapore. Looking at the, the data, this was published uh, at the start of COVID. If you look at the left, uh, it looks at the numbers for computer ownership and to the right, the uh, internet access. So in a country like Singapore that boasts just under 90% home ownership, 
uh, the bottom 10% of them uh, that don't own homes uh, typically rent them from the government. And these uh, people are the ones that we have identified from the low income families because with such high home ownerships, uh, it only speaks to their income levels if they cannot afford uh, homes in Singapore. So in terms of uh, computer ownership, three in 10, uh, they own a personal computer and about half of them have the internet access. And we've looked at the data again this year. Uh, this was a study done by uh, South Central uh, Family Services Center based in Singapore. The number has not changed the same. And we find this to be an, an urgent issue, despite the fact that uh, COVID is uh, tapering off all over the world and in Singapore as well. Uh, digital inclusion uh, is a key, key cornerstone of any uh, development work or any access to opportunities for people from low-income families. So why do I say that, right? So for the individual, uh, really accessing technology, the knowledge that's available online is, is a life changer, almost as uh, important as accessing education. And for families, uh, being part of the knowledge economy, the digital economy that's ever growing, uh, that's important for them to access the opportunities there, whether it's you know online opportunities, work, uh, government services, and for society, having these access enables us to to grow as a society, to 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 create economies that were not possible before. So, what is engineering good doing about it? Uh, these are the three services that we have. Uh, they are targeted at the uh, first, first list for laptop fixers community. This targets uh, low-income families that have the devices. However, for some reason, they're broken, they're not working. We are employing an asset-based community development model where we train people within the community to, with the skills, we equip them to the skills to, to learn what are the issues on their devices and how they can be fixed or resolved. Uh, for those that don't have laptops, we provide it to them. And lastly, uh, early stage work that we're doing is to look at universal uh, Wi-Fi access. Uh, we feel that any device is half as useful without the connection to the internet. There's only so much you can do. And the access to Wi-Fi is not always readily available as you see from the data earlier on. So uh, focusing on the laptop refer, uh, provision service, we started with a very simple idea at the start of COVID. We collect the laptops that need uh, from people to donate, uh, who donated it to them. We refurbish them and we give them out, especially to the children from low-income families to access education. However, uh, a simple idea does not equate to simple execution. Um, like many countries, we went through a, a lockdown of sorts uh, for several months. Uh, so this is to minimize face-to-face -face interaction. However, the, this means that we didn't have the resources to manage uh, the work that came in. And vo volunteers, they showed up uh, virtually uh, through various different means and we, we coordinated all the work through the technology that we ourselves were able to access. Um, to give you a sense of the numbers. Uh, oh, I forgot about this slide. This just to show you how the refurbishment works was done. Right, it was very manual process. Uh, we were able to get some people on site to, to fix them. Obviously, we need to be physically present to fix laptops. Right, it really takes a village and an entire kampong chipped in, entire village chipped in, uh, working together with uh, our volunteers, our corporate partners, our donors, lobbying the government to put in place uh, programs and, and, and support packages working through the social services agencies to identify the, the needs where the families are, right? And getting the support from the media to get the publicity that we need to get the program going. So uh, 200 volunteers, over 200 volunteers uh, signed up, multiracial, multinational, multi-generation, multi-class, everybody came in and chipped in. And we are great, very grateful to the agencies that we work with, our corporate partners who, who stepped up, donated uh, financially uh, in terms of devices as well. Featured in many uh, platforms that helped us to grow and to gain the awareness to get this program going. 
And in terms of the numbers, uh, we've given up over 7,000 laptops to date, uh, almost two and a half million dollars in e economic value. And by sheer accident, we realized that we are now in the uh, sustainability space as well by reducing the e-waste that's going out by giving out uh, laptops to people uh, based on the one by laptop. We're looking at uh, carbon footprints uh, savings of so lots of work went to it. Uh, it was not possible uh, without first understanding the needs on the ground, without activating the community, whether they are individual volunteers, whether they are corporate partners, the government, uh, and and our and the people that we know in the media. Uh, this work would not have been possible. So we feel that uh, the community effort is really part of the work that we is the key part of the work that we do. Uh, the technology is just a, a byproduct of uh, what we are actually achieving. Right, so that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Very, very inspiring experience. We have about four minutes uh, for questions. Um, turn over to Nicola to facilitate this quick session. Thanks very much, Robin. And, and look, thank you so much, Patrick, for such a, a, an amazing and inspiring presentation. Um, I've put a couple of things that you've, you've mentioned on our inspiration um, wall already. Um, I, I did wonder, so my, I, I had one, list, one question in the chat is about assistive technologies and how to make assistive technologies um, more accessible and affordable in ASEAN. Um, and then I have, because we have limited time, my, my question is also about the fact that where we see um, uh, smart solutions being developed, so quite often we find, find the solution comes before the problem. And I noticed in your presentation, you mentioned a three month period where you assess the problems. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about that, um, what, what that involves and what that looks like. Ah, so you're talking about uh, for good program then, right? So yes, uh, during a three month period, uh, actually it starts off with a, a day of workshops where we work with the youth to teach them about uh, empathy for persons with disabilities, the challenges that they face, uh, creative thinking and design. Uh, that kicks off the innovation uh, uh, period uh, during Tech for Good. And in that period, um, the youth, the teams are expected to work with persons with disabilities. So there were 30 teams that were recruited and each team was assigned uh, a, a community rep representative from uh, the that owns the part particular problem statement that they were addressing. Um, and throughout their process, uh, they examined the issues, they talked to the persons with disabilities, to understand their challenges and how the technology would fit into them, you know, whether it's a physical limitations or other limitations that they might have in terms of uh, achieving what they want. So the technology that they develop is meant to be enabling in that sense. Uh, so there's very much a, a coordination and an and open dialogue between the person's disability and the teams involved uh, in, in developing the solution. I hope that answers your question, Nicola. It does. Thank you, Patrick. And um, maybe just really mm. quickly, if you have any thoughts about um, making assisted technologies cheaper or more affordable across ASEAN. I know that's a difficult question, but just if that's something that yeah. you come across. Well, it, it, yeah, it is uh, one of our goals uh, in assistive technology. So the, we do recognize that a lot of these technologies are expensive and they do, do not necessarily do the job uh, completely. As mentioned, they need uh, customizations to fit uh, the individual needs. So one of the things that Engineering Good does uh, is to keep our solutions open source. Uh, we use uh, cheap production tools like uh, 3D printing. So for example, that, uh, that volume measuring device that you saw earlier on, everything was 3D printable. Uh, we are looking to put the schematics out there for everyone who access it and who can use it. Uh, our goal is really to, we understand that that is a problem. Um, well, the common explanations are there's no economies or skills in terms of production that costs the cost, that will cause the cost to go up. 
Uh, so keeping these uh, solutions open source, keeping them at cost and running ourselves as a charity, uh, not profit driven, uh, are ways that we are trying to chip away at the problem. Thanks, Patrick. And we do have we have one um, which will be the last last question or comment. Um, Min, would you like to please go ahead? You've got your hand up. Uh, hi, Patrick. I'm actually from Engineers Without Borders, NTU. So we are quite familiar with your good work. And one of our objectives is to actually empower and inspire students to generate change, uh, inclusive change through engineering solutions. But we realize, you know, this kind of engineering for good is not, you know, our reach is always people who are already passionate. But we want to really widen our reach and kind of normalize engineering for good. So what are some competency gaps students can work on? And can you share a bit more about like the Makerspace workshop on uh, teaching us uh, on like accessible design? So I feel like these are some competencies that we need to incorporate into our uh, academia also. And we would also like to go like one step further, like which is also sustainability be it in like responsible production or sustainable material designing. Yeah. So normally in school, we, we only learn, like we learn about like these technical things, but we need to like also learn how to do accessible design, learn about inclusivity and really the needs of the vulnerable communities. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think you covered several questions there. Uh, I think firstly is, the community uh, really have uh, active people talk about your work. Uh, that was how we grew. Um, agency, we were a small organization uh, before COVID started. Uh, today, uh, we're 14 volunteers in our system. Uh, before that, it was one tenth of uh, the size, right? So, really getting your people to talk about your work, share about the work uh, with the people that they know. Uh, and in terms of understanding the issues, uh, what we found most useful is to, I think this was in, in first uh, speaker, really working in the community, uh, talking to them, understanding the issues, the challenges that they face, uh, uh, and developing solutions around that and not work uh, based on assumptions. Uh, what I've learned coming to uh, engineering good is that we, we tend to we tend to think of issues in our own lens and how we perceive the issue to be. However, that is not how their lived experience is like. So if we are able to, to go to the ground, uh, work with the community and understand the challenges and the issues there, uh, that will inform your work much better. And in, in, in doing good work like that, uh, I, I believe that naturally uh, more people will take uh, interest in your work uh, and help you in the, uh, along. Um, even as engineering good, uh, although most of our volunteers are engineers, uh, what we're always looking for are communications people, advocacy people, people to, to talk about our work, share about our work, uh, people on social media who can then help us generate the, the interest to again help us uh, crystallize and distill the messages you need to put out there to, to, to get people to understand the issues and challenges and be involved. All right. Um, and in terms of the knowledge, the technical knowledge, uh, while you are in a university, um, I, the access to knowledge on technologies, I think it's something that you can talk to your professors about, your lecturers about. Uh, of course, uh, come down, uh, write into us at our website. We can see if we can organize something for you based on the topics you're interested in. Uh, um, what we do is very specific uh, to our community. Uh, based on the gaps of our uh, knowledge, what we want to learn and how we want to apply the information. So uh, it's not always a one size fits all solution in that sense. Uh, that helps me. Patrick, thank you so much. And Min, thank you for the great question. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand straight back to Robin. Thanks, Nicola. And uh, thank you to Patrick. And really, thank you to all of four speakers. What a, a great wealth of inspiration and ideas you've all given us. Um, this has been such an inspiring, uh, such an inspiring sharing. Now we are moving into the last 
10 minutes of our event today. And before I hand over for closing remarks to Elizabeth, I would like to invite um, our partner, Rambo, uh, to come to the stage and share um, uh, an e-learning platform that we might all be able to use to continue to engage on these issues. So Barbara Lama, Gender Equality and Social Inclusion Consultant for Rambo, the stage is yours. Thank you, Robin. Firstly, thank you to all of our speakers for the valuable informative insights to all the topics that we've discussed today. And to all our participants for the time and their discussions and the ideas that are going up on the inspiration wall. And, and of course, our interpreters who have been working really hard to get the message across. So uh, coming to the e-learning module. So as we come to the closure of a year long exercise from stakeholder inclusion, inclusion issues mapping to the inclus inclusive cities dialogues that were held from March of this year to July 2022. So now the team is now working on an e-learning module on inclusive cities with an aim to take the discussions we've had in those dialogues to a larger audience and to create awareness on the essential elements for building safe, livable, inclusive, resilient cities. So I would now request Hillary to please share the teaser video for the e-learning module on uh, inclusive cities, which we are looking to release early next year. Hillary, please. is not inclusive is not smart. The journey towards the creation of people-centric smart cities is not necessarily the straight and easy path, but it is the only path to achieve a just and equitable future. Both the journey and the destination are worthy and are within reach. Start your journey today. Take the new ASEAN Australia Smart Cities Trust Fund e-learning course, Cities for All, an introduction to inclusive cities. Thank you, Hilary. Yes, we look forward to your keen interest in taking the course. And thank you so much. Over to you, Robin. Mm, thank you so much, Barbara. It looks very interesting. Okay, uh, folks, we have reached our final uh, event of the event. Uh, I'd like to invite Elizabeth Jung, the Urban Development Specialist, Southeast Asia Department of the ADB, to deliver some closing remarks for us. Elizabeth. Thank you for the introduction, Robin. Um, can you hear me well? You can, okay, yes. Great. Yes. First and foremost, I would like to express my appreciation to the remarkable speakers and panelists for sharing their inspirational insights, initiative, and experience towards inclusive cities. My deepest gratitude goes to all who attended the events and helped us to make a, it such a successful and lively event today. In the Inclusive City events has been a very effective in meeting its purpose and helped us to deepen understanding of this very important urban agenda, which is rapidly changing and also emerging with the new challenges 
new challenges like aging population, climate change, and pandemics in a lens of smart, inclusive city. It's important to hear the voices from all the stakeholders from cities, um, including national and local government, private sectors, academia, NGOs, and CSOs, and work towards the inclusive future of the city. Hearing and learning from speakers, panelists, as well as the audience on the wall has educated all of us here and how the intersection of a smart digital technology and inclusiveness for women and girls, people with disabilities, minor minorities, elderly and children and other marginalized and vulnerable groups in the cities can come together to make cities more smart, inclusive, sustainable and livable. The Sombre and Smart City concept of the Makarsar City presented by our inclusivity champion, Mayor Pomanto, is a great example of leadership combining digital technologies and access to uh, critical medical services to vulnerables. Dr. Weiyu has given an important message that smart cities are not smart if they are not inclusive. Um, and uh, its final goal is to uh, enhance the life of the people. The Penang program on the nature-based climate adaptation presented by uh, Ms. Castello is another fantastic initiative that tackles effect on climate change in an inclusive way. Mr. Robert C. has showed how the simple use of digital technology or social media can play a critical role in bridging a different, different stakeholder together and effectively bring uh, changes. Mr. Van Her has shared us a getting started card kit uh, developed by the Smart City. Like Smart City, yes, has inspired us on free open source tool can be simple, accessible, and effective. Mr. Patrick, he inspired on us a very important agenda on supporting people with disabilities with assistive uh, technology and discussed how we can make the technology affordable and accessible. Thank you again for the fantastic presentation and discussions today on the intersection of smart technology and inclusive agenda on the city. Uh, before ending my closing remarks, I would like to express my special thanks to the dedicated participants to the nine inclusive cities dialogues over the course of six months. There are 185 participants who actively, uh, actively attended the dialogues, sharing their insights, views, experience, and energy to the inclusivity agenda, which also extensively covered the gender equality and social inclusion agenda. For those 185 participants to the dialogue, uh, please be informed that there is a certification of successful participation to the dialogue will be delivered to you after this event. Yes, it's a showing on the background, yes. Please also be engaged for um, the upcoming e-learning module on the inclusive cities uh, that is built on the dialogues. Please also feel free to provide your idea, feedbacks, and future plans on the inspirational wall. Yes, uh, this concludes the dialogues on inclusive city by the ASEAN Australia Smart City Fund Trust Funds uh, with the support of Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Government of Australia and facilitated by Rumble and the ICIA Foundation. However, this is not the end of the discussing inclusive smart city. The lessons and discussions on Jesse for inclusive cities from this dialogues and today's events will be transferred to all other activities under the ASEAN Australia Smart Cities Trust One's activities. Yeah. Finally, uh, my deepest thanks are, uh, of course, reserved for inclusive city events team, interpreters, and colleagues for their priceless contribution and for the running a smooth events today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for those very substantive and excellent comments, final remarks. Um, folks, the inspiration wall will be up for just a couple more days. Do feel free to continue to engage there. And uh, as Elizabeth has said, thank you all participants, speakers, donors, and uh, all of the organizers. Wonderful event. We wish you adieu. We will continue to engage with you in some online space somewhere. See you again. Thank you.